Today's episode is going to be a, a very important episode and a very emotional one, I think, and very important for you especially. Oh, yeah. uh, and without further ado, I would ask you to introduce us into today's topic and why is it so special for you personally? Well, today's topic is on did Jesus exist? Um, there's, before I really get into it, uh, I would like to take the time to uh, dedicate this particular topic to someone that has been a mentor to me. I've had the privilege of, privilege of meeting him once very briefly. Uh, if it were not for this individual, uh, would this video wouldn't be me and this video wouldn't be made right now. I wouldn't be speaking to you right now. And that is Robbie Zacharias. And I feel like this is a, a fitting topic to dedicate to because he's now as, uh, a lot of people know he's with the one that uh, he loved to serve the most and travel the globe to preach his message of hope. So this video I want to dedicate to the late Robbie Zacharias. But it's such an important topic for me because there are still people today that argue that Jesus never existed. Which with scholarship and, 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 you know, academics and all that stuff, it still blows my mind that people say that he never existed. Now, a person doesn't have to believe the divine claims about Christ. They don't have to believe that. But I remember Frank Turek once saying, is it Frank Turek? No, I think it was Dr. Gary Habermas said that if you want to reject the historical Jesus, then you need to reject every history department in every major university. Because the criteria that is met to show that Jesus existed historically is the same criteria that is used to determine if anything in ancient history is true, or if anyone in ancient history existed, like Alexander the Great, or Plato, or Socrates, or you know, uh, 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 Julius Caesar. But the funny thing is, is when you look at the skeptics that say, oh, he never existed. In fact, I talked to one about three or four months ago. And you ask him to give proof for what he's saying, and they can't do it. But then when you look at New Testament historians that are atheists and agnostics like Bart Ehrman and Gerd Ludemann, Gerd Ludemann says one of the most indisputable facts about ancient history is that Jesus Christ was crucified on a cross under the hands of Pontius Pilate, and this is an atheist. Um, Bart Ehrman, he's an agnostic, and he says Jesus existed whether you like it or not. Um, I don't know if anybody has seen the movie. There's three parts, God's Not Dead, and there's God's Not Dead, the second one, and the third one. The second one, there's a really good scene in there where um, Lee Strobel plays himself. He's a witness on the stand and the trial or the defense lawyer is asking him a series of questions because there's a teacher that's on trial because she mentioned the name of Jesus in a history class. <clears throat> and at the end of his uh, scene or the end of the, the questions, Lee Strobel says this, he says, look, denying Jesus won't make him go away. It just proves that no amount of evidence will convince you. So, I mean, you know, we have writings of Jesus that go outside the Bible, that go all the way to the first century. I mean, uh, I was listening to an interview, it's been slightly off topic, but I was listening to an interview uh, by Sean McDowell, and I forgot the guy he was interviewing, but he's a textual scholar. I apologize, I don't remember his name. But he was saying that we have a 15th century New Testament manuscript. And he says we have a 3rd century New Testament manuscript. And he says they're almost identical in what they say. So it shows that the manuscripts haven't changed. I mean, you look at uh, Josephus. And I know a lot of uh, skeptics will try to discredit Josephus. But Josephus talks about Jesus. Uh there's a man by the name of Eusebius in the 
later part of the first century, I believe. Uh, he talks about Jesus. You have a, a, a pagan historian by the name of Phlegon in the first century. He talks about Jesus almost in the same exact manner that you would read in the New Testament. You know, he talks about him being crucified and he talks about him, you know, rising from the dead. And he talks about him, you know, uh, his followers and stuff like that. So I, I think there's just too much history or too much evidence um, that proves that Jesus existed. And then because you basically have very solid historical accounts from all three main civilizations of the time, the Roman, the Greek, and the Hebrew, from historians that were not followers of Jesus, they were not Christian. Even pagan historians. Mm -hmm. You even have, you even, and here's the thing though, you can't discredit the New Testament as a source. You have four independent sources. I could be wrong, but four independent sources. You've got Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Those are credible sources as far as I'm concerned. Um, you have Paul's writings on Jesus in the first century. You know, I, I just, I, I know a lot of skeptics try to discredit the Bible, but I don't think you can discredit leave the New Testament out as a source that Jesus existed. Because of the, the gospel writers and the apostle Paul is why I believe um, and I could be wrong, and you know, there's somebody out there that's more knowledgeable than me, please correct me. But I think that because of the four gospels, and you have the writings of the Apostle Paul, and all the stuff that they had written, is why the church still exists today. Um, Paul's writings, you know, the Abdu Murray with RZIM is a trial lawyer. And he said one of the most convincing pieces of evidence, I think one that Christ exists, but one of the most convincing pieces of evidence that convinced him that Christianity was true. Most people would say it's 1 Corinthians 15, 3 through 7, because even the most critical historians have dated that passage to within two weeks of the crucifixion to no more than four or five years later. So you're still in the, the 30s, 80s. That wasn't the most convincing piece of evidence for him. He said the most convincing piece of evidence for him was Paul's uh, conversion. He says, you take somebody that was an opponent to Christianity, somebody that was persecuting and killing Christians and authorizing the killing of Christians to now all of a sudden becoming one of the biggest advocates for Christianity in writing 25% of the New Testament. So, I mean, you take that into consideration, and it, it, I just, I don't understand where these skeptics get this. I think there's, uh, yeah, there's several reasons why they reject the historicity of Jesus. And from my own experience, the people that I've met in my life that uh, would completely reject, would say that Jesus was just a myth, was invented later on. Um, it's just a made-up religion. Are people who actually also reject the um, the uh, historical methods, per se, they have no understanding of how history is written, interpreted, and, and understood. They have no understanding of the historical documents, how they're uh, tested, uh, how they're analyzed. And they basically completely disrupt it for the whole historical scholarship. They, they have no idea how this is done. And sometimes it makes me think, where did you get this opinion, such a strong opinion? Where did you get all the evidence that you need in order to form such a strong opinion. And then if you question them, they just find out that they have an opinion based off on another opinion of somebody else, or they just read something that could hear it very well with what they thought of the world in the first place. Right. You know, I tell you, um, most, uh, you, you look at, okay, where's it at? First Corinthians, I'm gonna read this real quick. Now this is, I'm, I'm, I'm not, you know, this is not my opinion. This is what I've heard from a lot of historians and a lot of New Testament scholars. That this passage, 1 Corinthians 15, 3 through 7, was delivered to Paul. And I believe you can read that in Galate, the first chapter of Galatians. Was delivered to, was given to Paul in the 30s AD, sometime in the mid-late 30s AD, from Peter and James. 
when it says that Paul went to Jerusalem for 14, 15 days. But scholars and historians have dated this passage to almost immediately after the crucifixion. And it is for I have delivered to you as a first of importance what I also received that Christ died for our sins in accordance with the scriptures, and that he was buried, and that he was raised on the third day in accordance with the scriptures, and that he appeared to Cephas, then to the twelve, and then he appeared to more than 500 brothers at one time, most of whom are still alive, though some have fallen asleep. And then he appeared to James, and then to all of the apostles, and last of all, as to one untimely born, he also appeared to me. That, to me, right there, is proof that Jesus just didn't develop over the years in a mythological sense. It's also proof that belief in the resurrection didn't evolve over a long period of time. Belief in the resurrection started immediately, before the 40s AD. And so if you have atheist historians saying, yeah, that passage was probably written somewhere within two weeks of the crucifixion no later than five or six years you're still in the 30s it still predates the 40s a.d and most new testament scholars agree that mark's gospel was the first written and it was written somewhere in the early mid 40s so most people will say that's the most convincing piece of evidence i think it's fascinating that abdu murray because i never thought about it that way said that paul's conversion is the most convincing piece of evidence but it goes back to my firm belief that the skeptics are not interested in the truth. What they're interested in is suppressing the truth. They don't want it to be true. Exactly. So they'll find ways to dance around it. They'll find ways to dance around it. They'll find ways to, you know, uh, try to discredit whatever it is that you present them because they don't want to, they've already made it in their mind that they're not going to believe it. And they don't want to believe it. That is true. And, and to a certain extent, we're all biased in the sense that mm. our basic convictions allow us to interpret the evidence as being good evidence that supports what we already believe or bad evidence when it doesn't support what we believe and then we reject it. Uh, however, this I think it's another interesting point to bring that let's say uh, in abstract that we didn't have reliable documentations or reliable historical documents about the life of Jesus, but then we have um, good historical evidence to uh, uh, f for the fact that so many Christians have died in the first centuries, have been persecuted, have been facing horrible deaths, and we also know from Hebrews 11 uh, how many horrible deaths uh, the people of faith have faced because they hoped for a better resurrection. Um, and we're all guilty of this to, to a certain extent, that we fail to relate to what it actually meant, like entire families to be persecuted, to lose your children, to lose your relatives, or to lose your own life for the faith, it would not make sense unless there was some very solid uh, um, evidence or very solid reasons for them to sacrifice so much because the church has been so persecuted and we forget about it uh, from the first century in the Roman Empire and then up until today, in a lot of countries that are not Christian, like they're not Christian civilizations, Christians are being burned, are being strangled, are being having their uh, throats cut. It's horrible deaths, and yet they do not denounce their faith. Uh, we fail to recognize that this requires a very deep conviction, mm -hmm. uh, and there must be something very solid behind it. You know, you remind me, uh, I remember. Not personally, but I remember hearing Ravi Zacharias once say, it was in one of his lectures, he says, an opinion is something that you hold, a conviction is something that holds you. Yeah. And if Christ was mythological, just a myth, Christianity wouldn't have lasted this long. Look at all the mythologies, the mythological beliefs of Greece. Nobody practices anymore. Nobody believes anymore. I remember reading, I think it's in Nabil's book, Seeking Allah, Finding Jesus. I think it's in that book. But he definitely said that the evidence is in favor of Christianity and not in Islam or any other religion. And, you know, Nabil didn't just very casually just decide to convert. His conversion after checking out the evidence for the historicity of Christianity and the reliability of Christianity took place over, I think, three or four years. 
and he finally said that the evidence was in favor of Christianity. That's true. And a lot of the conversions from the Islamic world to Christianity, they're mm -hmm. very dramatic in nature, if I can mm -hmm. say that. Um, I've, there's so many testimonies of, of, of devout Muslims that read the Quran and then they see things that are not coherent and then somehow they feel, they feel led to, to start reading the Bible and then they, they have the revelation of the truth. And then they compare them and they show the inconsistencies of the Quran. Uh, compared to to the Bible, or sometimes it's even more dramatic, you know, like um, almost fanatical Islamists, they, they have this vision or they have a dream of, of even Jesus himself. It's very often that this happens, and I thought what you just said, that the convictions hold you as a person, as a being, as a whole, and that they need something very, very dramatic in order to get out of those convictions, because Islam is just very, you know, like narrow-minded in some way you just have to apply these rules in your life and hope for the best in the end it's not yes. about a relationship with god it's not uh we also talked in, in the other episode uh, i'm not gonna be too long on this topic about the idea of the trinity trinity mm -hmm. compared to that of the islam that god is is very abstract in islam it's not a relational being mm -hmm. um, so we have these ample uh myriads of of evidence is that there has to be something and that there's solid, there has to be solid evidence for it based on in judging on how people turn to Christ, become Christian and decide to follow until their death even. You know, I, I, this might be a slightly off topic, but one of the things that really kind of impressed me was that interview I heard with Sean McDowell. He was interviewing a textual scholar and I feel bad because I can't remember that scholar's name. Um, but I know that he uh, worked closely with, uh, or works closely with uh, New Testament scholar or textual critic, uh, Dan Wallace. But when he said that we have a 15th century manuscript for the New Testament, and we have a third century manuscript for the New Testament. And he said, they're almost identical in everything that they say. Because a lot of skeptics will say, well, you know, the New Testament is, like Bart Hammond will say, you can't trust the manuscripts because, you know, or whatever, that it's been corrupted. And then this uh, scholar that uh, Sean McDowell was interviewing was saying, well, my response to Bart Ehrman would be, well, how do you know it's been corrupted if we don't have the original? What if it hasn't been corrupted? And so I think these skeptics just love to try to invent ways or invent arguments that sound good but are really straw men in essence to try to discredit. Mm -hmm. And I think it's, as Paul says um, in Romans 1, I think in verse 18, 17, 18, and it's where he says they exchanged the truth of God for a lie. So they, they, they come up with all these, these uh, silly ideas and, and ways to try to discredit the New Testament. Um, but one thing, I, you know, you hear this, well, here's the historical Jesus, and then here's the, the, the Jesus of the New Testament. To me, they're one and the same. There's no such thing as, well, here's the historical Jesus, but then now here's the Jesus of the Bible. To me, the historical Jesus is the one of the New Testament, the one that you read about walking on water and raising people from the dead and, and healing the sick and casting out demons. To me, that is the historical Jesus, and I believe that... The, the, the evidence proves that that Jesus is the one that existed. Because if Jesus didn't rise from the dead, well, if he never existed, he wouldn't have been able to have risen from the dead. But if he didn't rise from the dead, a lot of things wouldn't have happened. Christianity wouldn't have started. Paul wouldn't have been com become converted. And Christianity wouldn't exist today. Because when you look at, when you read the Gospels after his death, you know, the disciples were scared. They ran. They hid. Yeah. And it uh, amazes me that the bravery of the women that is recorded in the, New God, in the New Testament, they weren't scared. They were bold. They stood there right at the cross with him until he died. But if he didn't rise, Christianity would have never started. Because when he rose from the dead... 
and appeared to his disciples physically, not spiritually, physically. It changed them. And I believe it's in Second Peter, where Peter says, for we did not follow cleverly devised plans when we told you about the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, in my favorite part right here, but we were eyewitnesses of his majesty. That key word to me right there, eyewitnesses. Eyewitnesses. And so, if somebody is bent on not believing something, as Lee Strobel kind of said in that movie, it doesn't matter how much evidence you throw at them, they're not going to believe it anyways. And so, it's... Um, so, it is not a... It is always a question of the heart, um, of the heart mm -hmm. of, of man and the willingness to, to know the truth. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the willingness to know the truth. It's like, I heard this quote from Ravi Zacharias, uh, George MacDonald. I think that's it. Yeah, George MacDonald. He says, to give him truth who loves it not is to only give him more multiplied reasons for misinterpretation. So if the person doesn't love the truth, Give him truth who loves it not is to only give him more multiplied reasons for misinterpretation. And I think that is absolutely true because I can't tell you how many skeptics I have talked to. And every time I give them an answer, they take what I said and they try to twist what I said yes. to try to say, aha, see, I told you it's not true. And I, I would I'd always say, it's not what I said. You yeah. twisted what I said. I said what I said was this. So... Um, there's um, a new book that just came out. It was Robbie's last book, uh, Seeing Jesus from the East with uh, Abdul Murray. It is a really good book. Uh, it just came out. Uh, I encourage everyone to get a copy of it and read it. Um, I think uh, originally, the, from, what I was, from what I heard, that uh, Nabil Qureshi was originally supposed to be the one to uh, author the book. It was his idea. But then he became ill and then passed away. And then Robbie had asked Abdu to uh, write the book with him. But that's one of the reasons why I like to talk about or talk, uh, share with skeptics what Garrett Ludeman and Bart Ehrman say, because they're not on our side. They're atheists, they're agnostics. And it's, to me, I think hard for the atheist or the skeptic to discredit that when the person like Bart Ehrman and Gary Ludeman is on the same side as the atheist. The only difference is, is you know, they're not um, ignorant about history. If that makes yes, sense. Yes. And all the uh, the books that you mentioned, all the resources we, we mentioned and talked about, we will uh, write them down in the description of the video. Mm -hmm. um, and now, just because we have about eight minutes left, uh, the day now that we're recording, it's almost a day. Uh, a day has passed since uh, we found out about uh, Ravi's, Ravi's passing away. Mm -hmm. And I think everybody who's watching this video can share a personal testimony that is um, very profound and very deep about how Ravi Zacharias influenced their lives in one way or another. We, I think we all were deeply touched by his life. He was one of the most brilliant minds of the 21st century, one of the most incredible apologists uh, in the history of Christianity, I would even say, that we know. Um, and um, it is very emotional for, for so many of us. Uh, what we uh, really grieve for is our own loss, because we know where he is. And that's, at the same time, a reason to rejoice knowing the, the hope that we have and reinstating the importance of resurrection. Because that's the most important uh, doctrine, the, the core of our faith. Without the resurrection, everything we believe would be futile. And that's exactly what you said, that we have so many uh, reasons to believe ample historical evidences that Jesus Christ was indeed a historical figure and that his resurrection indeed happened because we have eyewitnesses and we have also the the cloud of the witnesses of the entire church that suffered and died in this hope 
of the future resurrection. Yep, absolutely. Uh, that was powerful. I really enjoyed what you said. Um, Ravi Zacharias, I remember. If anybody's interested in learning apologetics, doesn't have a lot of time to commit to it or the money to go to a university, I highly recommend RZIM Academy. It's a, it's a 12 week online course. They call it the core module. It's 12 weeks of apologetics training videos and it's taught by Robbie Zacharias and the RZIM team. I was in the very first class that launched in 2014. Now, I remember Robbie saying that apologetics is the seasoning, the gospel is the main course. And I just always thought that, that that always stuck with me. Apologetics is the main is the seasoning that you, you sprinkle on the main course, and the main course is, is, is the gospel. But um, you know, like I said, if it if it were not for Robbie Zacharias, I remember the first time I heard him speak. Um it was uh, in 2014 at uh, the Mormon Tabernacle. And um, no, I take that back. I'm sorry. That is the first time I saw him speak. The first time I heard him was 2013. And it was when he spoke at the Mormon Tabernacle in 2004. That message changed my life forever. But it's because of Robbie's impact and Robbie's influence on my life that I'm even a student at Biola University. If it were not for him, I, you know, I wouldn't, wouldn't be there today. Uh, last week, I just submitted my application for the Masters of Apologetics. Uh, I'm going to hopefully get my Master's degree in Apologetics, but I owe that to Robbie's influence. And so I um, hope that this video uh, is a good tribute to him. Um, I think that if people really want to know the truth, the truth is out there. Jesus said, know the truth and the truth will set you free. I happen to take that to mean know him and he can set you free. That's what I take that verse to mean. But the truth is out there and if people want it, are really interested in the truth, they will find the truth. If you're a skeptic and you're bent on uh, uh, manipulating the truth, and if you're bent on not finding the truth, then no amount of evidence will convince you. And so that's kind of uh, my take on that. I have to admit there was a time in my life, and I still have questions, but there was a time in my life where I seriously doubted whether or not Christianity was even true or whether or not even the God existed. But over the years of studying apologetics and you know, theological studies, um, a lot of those doubts have gone away. Because I, I, realize, I, I believe now that it's more reasonable to believe that an intelligent being, a God, put all of this together than to believe that it was done by some blind, accidental just accident it just accidentally just came into existence so that's, that's, true. that's uh, where i stand and i hope in this very short time that we managed to at least bring some to honor uh dr ravi's name by um talking about the importance of apologetics that it's not only uh, a tool to share the gospel and to make people listen to us but it's also a medicine for our own uh, doubts that we all face at some time or another in life. And it's very easy to look around. You see so many bad things happening that are not supposed to be, and you get so discouraged. And sometimes you, you follow your heart rather than your mind. And your mind is what I think is the, the most sacred possession that we have, because with it, we understand the will of God and we can understand the things that God has left on this earth to be evidence for his existence. Um, and so apologetics helps us to go away from our emotions and rationalize things and see that this is, this is the only way. There's, yeah. there's nothing else outside of it. There's no other alternative. There's only Jesus and Jesus resurrected. Yep, absolutely. Um, 
I think sometimes it's our emotions that get the best of us and run away with us or our fears. You know, I, I remember where I almost considered embracing atheism. It had to be 10, 11 years ago. So when, and I, every once in a while, I'll run into somebody that is considering atheism, but it's a genuine consideration on their part where they have told me, I want to believe in God. I know someone personally, he says, I want to believe that God is real. I'm just scared that he might not be. And I don't know yeah. if he really exists. And I, though, that person, because I can relate to that person so much because I was almost there at one time, I think is different than the person who doesn't want to submit to the idea of God or doesn't want to believe in God because they want to live however they want or it becomes a moral issue um, and not a, you know. So when you find those people, those are the ones that I love to try to talk to the most because you know that they want the truth. They, 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 they just haven't seen it, I guess, if that makes any sense. And I also like to encourage everybody who's already a believer and are facing doubts, because there's two types of reaction. You face a doubt and you treat it cynically and you dissect it and then you see where it comes from. But there's the other type of reaction, which is you get afraid. What if I sin? Do I like faith? And I would like to encourage you that doubts are, can be good because if you have a doubt, then you're forced to get even deeper into that problem. Mm -hmm. And every doubt can be a great opportunity to get closer to God to gain even deeper knowledge about God's existence and to grow as a person and as a Christian. So every time you have a doubt, do not uh, block yourself emotionally. Don't, don't freak out. Uh, just embrace it and, and pursue it because if the Bible is the truth, it will offer you answers to all the questions you have. And uh, one of the things that I like to believe is that most of the questions that we have today um, in, relations, in relation to our doubts or to the existence of God have already been answered in the 2,000 years of uh, Christian history. So there's always a resource somewhere. I agree. You know, something you said remind me, re reminded me of something that uh, Robbie Zacharias said once. It was an uh, atheist that asked him the question. He says, you know, in all the years that we crossed the globe, he said, um, we've never heard a new a new question. He says all, they, they've been the same. He says um, we're given a piece of paper and or, or, or something. If I'm remembering it right, and we ask the the host of the the event to write down all the questions. He says we've never seen a new one. They've always been the same. And I think that kind of holds true throughout history. Um, and while this uh, video is a tribute to Ravi, something that he said, I heard him say that, I mean, it, his intellect and his exegesis on scripture, in my opinion, was way above normal, way above average. And I mean that like as a compliment. I mean, his insight and intellect and exegesis on scripture was just mind blowing. I remember him talking about uh, history, and he talked about how the existentialist, and I could be slaughtering this slightly, the existentialist, um, it was all about, uh, I think it was about the now or the future, and then the utopian, it was, you know, uh, a certain piece of history, and, uh, you know, he went on and on and on. He says, but when Jesus broke the bread, and said, do this in remembrance of me. He says, you're proclaiming the Lord's death in the past. And he says, and in the present. And then he says, and in the future when he comes back. And he said that Jesus was reminding us that all of history is fused with meaning. I hope I didn't slaughter that quote, but you can go that on. Is, that is incredible. Yeah. All his answer, answers were completely disarming mm -hmm. uh, of the opposite party. It, it were, there were sometimes I would even say that they were perfect. You couldn't subtract anything from them. You couldn't add anything. 
they're so marvelous and all encompassing. And uh, unfortunately, we will have to end this video. And I would like to conclude with the uh, just a call to everybody who's watching to be thankful to God for for the life of Ravi Zacharias yep. and uh, to just uh, think about his his great personality, his incredible fire that he had in his heart for Christ. Mm -hmm. And not only was he a true man of God, but he was also a great gentleman. And mm -hmm. I would always remember him as that. And I hope this message was was a blessing to everybody. It was indeed for us. Um, and I would like to thank you for, for today. Um, thank you. And see you next time. See you next time, Roxandra. God bless you. God bless you too.